Lord were to blow the horn right now. Look, if you will, please get a little bit of learning tonight from the Bible. He says in verse 15, 2 Timothy 2, 15, study. Study to what? Show thyself approved. Boy, you could hit every one of those things. Study to show thyself approved. To who? Unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they might possibly could, maybe. No, he said, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their word, the ones that are given you, that eat as doth a canker. A uh, canker, they used to have a thing called canker sores. That's like rust on, a, on, a, on metal or steel. That's like mold on bread. Uh, it, 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 it destroys it over a period of time. It says, he just, their word doth eat like canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're all millennials. Brother Sam, you pray and ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Thank you. You can be seated. Don't worry about Deke. He's out of town. He'll be back. Brother Richard's there and Brother Brad's here. So we're, we're doing okay. And pray this week for Brother Woodard for two things. Number one, that he repent of his backslidden condition and not help you guys in the choir today. That disturbed me. You know, that bothered me. I mean, he's a, he's a builder and he's over. I'm sure he had a great excuse. I understand. He got a lot, a lot going on and a lot of things difficult and probably had a backed up sewer pipe. And, and I understand that. But Pray that he'll get right over that. But, uh, and, then, and then after he gets right over that, that the Lord will give him direction to get things moving, all seriously to get things moving in the right direction out here. And the Lord will give him graciousness there. I have to mess with you, Brother Holland, just a smidgen. You know, that kind of, otherwise somebody will think neptitism, you know. <laughs> Other people will think, you know, well, if I was the preacher's nephew, and then you're thinking, I don't really want to be the preacher's nephew. <laughs> Not if you get picked on like that. All right, now I want you to see something here, and this is given to you for on the behalf of taking pressure off, not putting pressure on. Too often when people read certain things in the Bible, they think, oh, well, now what I'm supposed to do is actively shun something, so i got to make a jerk of myself. No, what he's letting you know is, is there are certain times that it's okay for you to disagree with somebody else and to leave them alone. And then he gives you a warning, and he said, listen, if you listen to that stuff, it will increase to more ungodliness. So he's given you the liberty to say, don't feel guilty about telling somebody, I don't want to hear your foolishness. Let me tell you this also. Be careful about the kind of doctrine that you listen to because if you listen to it long enough, sooner or later you begin to like the person that you're hearing it from and then you disassociate what's being taught with the person that's teaching it and then it's because they're nice people you start to swallow down some of their doctrine and then before long you'll be just where they are here. Now watch the progression how he shows you in your King James Bible. Notice he says study. Why? So that you can rightly divide, so you can prepare prepare yourself, you'll know what is profane and vain babblings because they will accrue and they were doth in, uh, eat as doth a canker and then he gives you the names of the individuals. So what he said is shun it and then he shows you the people that you have to shun in order to shun their teaching. Now let me give you these as a couple of illustrations or examples here if I could. Look in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes you have to just tell certain people, uh, I'll get some to uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus in here in just a minute, they're all millennial, the, the uh, resurrection's already taken place, you're going to make everything better, and then the Lord's going to come back. Well, I got news for you, Southern Baptists taught that for years. You may or may not know that. And the Southern Baptists taught for years that the, the white horse rider in the book of Revelation, they taught that that was Jesus Christ. That's the Antichrist. Now, don't get upset. I was raised Southern Baptist. My dad didn't teach that, but he was one of the few that went to school and didn't teach what they taught because he believed that that was the Antichrist. But they taught that, that that was Jesus Christ because he didn't have a bow in his hand and because he was bringing peace. And that stuff was teaching false doctrine and put the church right smack dab in the tribulation. And what they taught was that after we get everything fixed up, they called it bringing in the kingdom, then God's going to come down and bless it because we've done such a good job cleaning up the whole world. This is what led into churches being involved in politics. That started long before Martin Luther King came along in the 1960s, early 1960s, and started using the church as for a civil rights movement. Long before Martin Luther King came into the black church to use it for political reasons and that kind of a thing, and the reverends were pushing it through the churches. You know why? Because those folks went to church. 
the way that they were able to contact people was because those folks went to church. And so they used the church as their platform. But long before that, back in the 50s, in the late 40s, they were already teaching this movement that we need to put Christians in office in order to make the world a better place. And thus came the birth of politics in the pulpit. And now all of a sudden it's become the norm where everybody thinks, oh, well, if you're in the pulpit, who are we voting for? I vote for King Jesus. Amen. And beyond that, I couldn't tell you. And I'd be honest with you, you vote for whoever you want to vote for. It doesn't matter. You're only voting to make things good on yourself. But the bottom line is it, it really doesn't matter to me who you vote for. You're not moving the needle one way or the other. I just wish some of you would get as excited about uh, Jesus as you do about your candidate. I, and that would be, a, I mean, that'd be a blessing. You would have to hurry up and get the building built out there. You need a tabernacle. Now listen, Paul's trying to tell Timothy and Timothy is to tell us. He said, listen, there's some things, Tim, you're going to have to know and understand. You're going to have to study on your own. You can't ride my coattails. In other words, you, you can read all my commentaries and you can listen to all my tapes, Timothy, and you can go to all the meetings with me, but at some place, somewhere, you're going to have to study to show your own self approved unto God, not to me, not to a congregation, but unto God. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. You have to have your own personal time with the Lord. You have to have your own personal study time. Some of you, you need to be regulated and you need to have the, rig the, the rigidness or the structure of study habits. Some of you don't have study habits. I have to study for a habit. In other words, I, I have to study so it helps to keep me in the book. That's a good thing. That's one of the reasons God called me to preach. He figured, well, if I don't call him to preach, he probably won't study. And maybe I wouldn't. I, I don't know. But now I don't have any choice. But I actually enjoy studying. And fortunately, I've developed a few good study habits. But here's one of the things that I think you need to know about study. Much study is a weariness to the flesh. Your flesh would rather sit on its blessed assurance and watch television and eat ice cream if you can do that or a fat bomb or whatever it is that you're able to eat or drink a glass of grass or whatever it might be, not the kind you smoke. But, 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 but your flesh doesn't like to sit down and talk about spiritual things. You know, I'm trying to get some stuff ready for the book of Hebrews and so I'm trying to do a chapter a day and I'm right now on part to about a half a chapter a day because there's so many notes that are required even though I've had it four or five different times. Here's the thing, sometimes you can't just randomly read your Bible, you need to study. And sometimes you know what you have to do? You have to have a teacher sit down with you and teach you some things there and take some notes and do the things along the way so that it'll hold your discipline enough to make you study to show yourself approved. Get yourself a study guide. I'm not trying to bump the enrollment as far as school is concerned, but you're not too young to start to study, to learn how to study. You say, well, now wait a minute. Look, they start you studying when you're in the first grade. When you hit the first grade, they give you homework. You go home and you write your letters, right? You write your A is for apple and your B is for B and your C is for, or C plus in the case of our song, that kind of a thing. But, but you learn to write your letters. You learn to write, I don't know if y'all, do y'all still write in cursive? Do y'all even know what that is? It's not texting. Do you still write in cursive and all that stuff? Okay, well good, praise the Lord. So y'all still sign your name? You don't like just, hey, I'll send it to you in a text? You still sign your name? I'm getting some... Okay, do, but do you understand, the point I'm making to you is about, is about studying. It's not natural to want to study. So you have to discipline yourself to have the character to study. We have some guys that are in school now and they decided to start school and so what they did was is in the morning when they wake up for the first hour in the morning they sit down and they do school. And here's what they've said across the board. Now I have a certain amount that I do every single day and it keeps me on par and it makes me have to study because I'm held accountable by my teachers, my homeroom teachers are uh, Brother Sam, Brother Wooder, Brother Josh, Brother Walker, Brother Wheeler, and so on and so forth. And if it's me with their outlines or, or whatever it might be. When he says study to show yourself approved, you have to be willing to sit down. That doesn't mean read. But you've got to be careful because after he says study, notice the warning that he gives you, but shun. <coughs> in other words, when you're studying, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that some things people are trying to teach you are wrong. And he says when you do that, 
He said, listen, make sure that you shun those things. Don't pay attention to those things. Don't let those things misguide you. Don't let them misdirect you. Because as much as there's truth out there, there is non-truth non or mistruth out there. As much as there is reality out there and truth, there's heresy out there. There must also be heresies among you that the man of God may be proven. You understand? Watch this. 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse 20. Oh, Timothy... Keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Look in the same there. Look in chapter number 1. Look at verse number 4. It's First Timothy chapter number 1. Look at verse number 4. He says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in the faith, so do. Look down in verse number 6, same passage. For which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Well, Paul, you're being kind of rough on us. Look in chapter number 6 right there. Chapter number 6, 1 Timothy. Look in verse number 4. Make it three. If any man teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, wherefore have cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, destitute of truth, supposing gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. That's a mouthful. You know what he just said? Everybody that's teaching is not supposed to be teaching, and everybody that's teaching doesn't teach the right things. Take your Bible and come, if you will, with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Uh, make it Colossians. No, let's go to 1 Corinthians first. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, this is done not to put pressure on you, but to take pressure off of you. If you know how to rightly divide your Bible, it will not be long before you will be able to sniff out every heretic there is trying to teach you something for their own benefit. Because you can tell right off the bat, they're going to go right off the bat and try to put you in the tribulation and try to get you to prepare to go against the government, try to get you to prepare for the Antichrist and try to get you to prepare for what's going to happen during the tribulation period and try to tell you the difference of the gospel in the tribulation period and try to add works to your salvation. You'll be able to put it right off the bat. They'll tell you that you're not saved if you're not doing the following things. You say, what is that? That's vain jangling. Amen. You say, well, I can handle that. The Bible said you keep listening to it. You know what he said? It will increase to more ungodliness. Maybe the ungodliness is, as you get so proud about you being right, and you know that they're wrong, maybe your problem then is that you have, that you have the sin of pride. He says, in my Bible, shun them and stay away from it because it will increase to more ungodliness. That's across the board, the same way study is. I don't need to keep studying that stuff. I don't need to read Nietzsche's works anymore. I don't need to read Hitler's Mein Kampf anymore. I didn't say don't read it. I don't need to read War and Peace anymore. That's a snooze fest. But at any rate, when you come through there after you've done that, don't keep messing around with that stuff. Nietzsche's the one that didn't believe in any God. You know, God is dead, so you wind up having the, the magnificent Superman and that kind of a thing, and, and, and man becomes his own God, and man determines what uh, is supposed to be uh, right for himself, so man uh, man becomes God and governs his own universe and goes to hell when he dies, Nietzsche. You know that. Surely you know that by now. You say, why? He's dead in hell. You know who read, my, who read uh, Nietzsche's works? Stalin and Hitler. They had a lot to do with, with him formulating things. You say, why? It will increase. It will increase. It will increase to more ungodliness. Those guys were ungodly, boy. I'm telling you what. You know what? This is a strange thing. That guy that advocated the, the, uh, the throne over there, and I'll think of his name in a minute. His brother took the throne. His brother was a little bit sickly during World War II, and the other boy was the pretty boy, and he was the one making all of the, uh, the appearances and stuff like that. Oh, good night, man. King George's uh, kids, Edward. What was the other one's name? Anyway, the, the, anyhow, the, the, the one guy, he decides, you know, because he loves this, uh, this uh, woman that was over there at the time, he decides uh, because the, the crown didn't want him to be married to a divorced woman and it was against the policies and this and that and the other, he abdicated the throne, meaning he gave it up in order to be over there with him. You know what that guy did? That's the elder brother. Yes. Do you know what that guy did? You probably don't study history, probably don't know anything about history. You know what that Jack Legg did? Him and his wife went over there and had big time meetings with Hitler and paraded around with Hitler and spent time with Hitler. 
and then worked out a secret under the table deal that if they would come over there and bomb England at the time that it was going on, that his brother, his younger brother, would leave the throne and he could put himself back in there because he was sure that his brother didn't have the medal it would take to stand up to Hitler. And he tried to work out a deal because Hitler said, well, if we move your brother out, once we take it over, I'll put you back in. It's in history. You say, what happened to him? His brother finally got smart and sent him down there to the Bahamas and had him to be in the Bahamas from that day on. And he died out there in the Bahamas taking care of all that stuff. You say, what was he interested in? A throne, a crown, got to listen to the wrong people. And people thought he was the Mr. Popular. This is how they wave. They're backwards. They wave this way, you know, like they're, I don't know, calling cows or come to the house or something. I don't know what that is. You say, why would you say that stuff? There's certain things you need to understand about human nature. Power hungry. He was the king and he left it for love, they said. Well, what a great love story, stupid. That's the same mess that Eve got in the garden with Adam. See, you like that story. But is it right? To tell me that they believe that that's God ordaining them. You know what happens to them when they go in for their uh, 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 services and stuff like that? They bring out the little veil thing. It's all Catholic, but you know what they believe? They believe they become part of deity. And they have a special service and then God's hands are uniquely upon those individuals. Whew. My goodness, boy, aren't you headed for trouble? All right, look, if you will, please, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil communications, as far as a Christian is concerned, doesn't have to be cussing and screaming and hollering and yelling and filthy mouth and filthy talk. In the Bible, it has to do with doctrinal things. How do you know that, preacher? Where we just were. Study to show thyself approved. And then he said, but shun vain and profane babblings. The passages I gave you didn't have anything to do with a filthy mouth. It had to do with false doctrine. It had to do with false teaching. Now, I don't know why this is, and I'm not the only one that uh, maybe believes this way, but I don't believe it strong enough, I don't guess, because I guess I should maybe have class every single night. Come to Ephesians chapter number 4, if you would, please. Ephesians chapter number 4. But in that Bible, doctrinal issues become a, a very important point. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, he says, preach the what? Come on, preachers, preach the what? Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? For the time shall come when they will not endure sound what? But heap to themselves having itching ears and be turned from the truth unto what? Fables. You know what he said? In the pulpits, there's people that are teaching you fables instead of preaching to you what the Bible said. Now, you can't get hurt by a Bible preacher if he's preaching what the Bible says rightly divided. Why? Because you got the Bible in front of you. But you need to have the Bible understand it yourself so that when the preacher's preaching, you're holding him accountable, he's holding you accountable. You're just as much holding me accountable as I'm holding you accountable. I'm supposed to preach what the book says. You're supposed to see what the book says. And then the Holy Spirit, me and you, line up on the same page. You say, what does that do? I, I'm teaching you the test. You got the answers in front of you. You say, what does that do? Well, for me, y'all around here, you're like little teeth and eyeballs. You got little knives and forks and you got little bandanas and you're like, you better feed me or we're going to stick you and have you for dinner because you read and study your Bible. Well, what a great check and balance system because I know if I'm going to preach, I better be in the book or y'all going to be like, I remember a few weeks ago, I got up and I said, I'm going to preach to you today from the living Bible. All the air got sucked right out of the room. <laughs> and then I said, I mean the King James, you know, and then y'all were like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But as soon as I said living Bible, y'all were like, apostate, crucify him, crucify him. <laughs> right. But here's the thing that's done for your protection. So that when a preacher comes up, no matter how good he might be, when he's doctrinally incorrect, you know what the Lord said? Don't listen to that smooth talking fella, Mr. Mike around his ear deal. <laughs> Let's take our Bibles. Right? Yes. Well, preacher, we wear these things because it makes us connect with so much more clarity. You mean so you can hear yourself breathing? We used to put people like you in jail for making obscene phone calls. Yes, we did. We put a trap and trace on your phone and catch you making one of them calls, and all of a sudden, we get a knock. And it wasn't the insurance man. 
You say, why? Because you're a stinking pervert. Why would you use God's pulpit to talk like that to people? All right, lest I digress. Ephesians chapter number 4, look if you will, verse number 29. I'm trying to hurry. Ephesians 4, 29. I just say that to make you think I really am. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That doesn't have to do with just your foul language and your dirty jokes. That has to do with communication of a thought or an idea or a doctrine. And when you're doing that, these guys get up to preach, they can tell you, and you better thank the Lord, you got some come to, uh, let's see, 1 Timothy chapter, oh no, it's not 1 Timothy. Wait a minute, it's coming, it's coming. Colossians, come to Colossians 2. These guys get up to preach, and there's pressure on them. And there's pressure on them. You say, why? You people put pressure on them. They take it serious. You thank the Lord for that. I thank the Lord it allows me the privilege of travel, and I, and I appreciate that, and I don't take it for granted. But these guys get up here, their guns are fully loaded. They're not like a lot of people, gun barrel straight and just as empty. They got something to say. Because why? They've been studying. But they're not going to misguide you. They're not going to mislead you. They're not going to misdirect you. You say, why? They know whose pulpit that is. You say, preacher, that's yours. No, that ain't mine. That's God's pulpit. That belongs to him. I met with a couple this afternoon for just a little while. And they said, it's a, a pretty amazing service today and this and that and the other. And I said, well, let me just tell you this. I have a lot of men and women who will start somewhere around 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And they start praying for me. And I get a text, praying for you, preacher, praying for you, pray, praying for today, preacher, praying. I said, that's then God answering their prayers. That's why it comes out that way. It's your fault I preach this way. <laughs> See, y'all always blaming me. The preacher got up jacked up a few weeks ago when he was preaching about the men. And man, I mean, he really tore into the men, boy. And none of them listened. They're like, yeah, I, got, I, felt, I felt your pain, ladies, when you talked to him and say, baby, you, you know, you just don't listen to me. I felt that on that a couple of Sundays ago. I'm preaching about men. They're like, I don't know who he's talking to. But I sure wish they'd get right because I know if he were to call my wife up there, she would give testimony that I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. And that's why the Lord laid that message on me. All I can tell you fellows is this, the, you, the women must have been out praying you men because I had preached on men for two solid weeks. And the evidence is here. I got more women here tonight than men. Men are like, oh, he's not going to talk to me like that. That just makes me so mad I could squeeze a grape. <laughs> you can't talk to a man like a man anymore. It's kind of like, you know. Talk to the hand, the head ain't hearing. You need to eat some raw meat or something, man. I mean, really. I mean, God, go, go hit, your head, uh, hit your hand with a sledgehammer or something. Get some blood flowing. I mean, it's like it, it, if you were to cut your hand, would it even bleed or would there be enough blood in there to... You got red blood and you were not. Amen. It should have jacked you up. It Sure, it should have. It should have upset you. It should have made you like... Yeah, you know what? He's calling me out. Thank the Lord he is. I need to get right about some things. Instead, you act like a bunch of little schoolgirls and run out. I can't, I don't know. What in the world he's talking like that for? I mean, what does he think he is? I'm a preacher. I, I, the women prayed and the Lord delivered it the way he delivered it. You know, oh, you're all, preacher, we're all behind you until it's your turn in the barrel. And it's like, I don't know where he got that message. I'm telling you, the women out prayed you. And if the Lord was in that, then you better listen to what he had to say to you. And if it didn't apply to you, if the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. But if it does, you might want to put it on. You know, say why. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, there is a spiritual uh, uh, thing going on right now. There's a transaction going on right now. It is not physical. It is spiritual. From my mouth to your ears and into your heart is the Holy Spirit working and a bunch of demonic things flying around here trying to twist it and turn it and back it up and keep you from getting it and taking it out. And somebody, sure as I'm here, the phone will ring or somebody will decide they got to take a text or they're in the middle of the service or somebody will stand up and walk out. they got to go to the bathroom or something right at a time when God's dealing with you. It is not physical. It is spiritual. It is interrupting the only thing that holds the universe together. Listen, you start looking in the book of Hebrews. You know what you realize? By the word of his power, everything is held together. Yes. That pew that Matthew is sitting on right now, you have become a man. You sitting in TK spot. <laughs> you are bold or dumb one. I don't know. <laughs> 
But if he comes over, I'd just move in. I'd just like, I'm, I'll move over, you know. But, but, but you know what's holding that pew together? You say nails and glue. Uh-uh, the word of his power. If the Lord spoke, the whole thing would come apart. Literally, all the elements and all that would just, just come unglued that way. You know what he says? The most important thing are words. You can't get that out of pictures. It's words. So God gives you a Bible. It's written in words. You say, why? That's the stitches in the garment. You know what holds the universe together that he's wearing? Words by the word of his power. That's what's holding everything together. So you know what he tells you? He said, just as much as I have the right kind of words, the world has their kind of words, the flesh has its kind of words, and trust me when I tell you 2 Corinthians 11, the devil has his kind of words. And just like the Lord has his preachers, and the world has their preachers, and then the devil will have his preachers. The Bible says they will appear as ministers of righteousness. And no marvel, for Satan himself can appear as an angel of light. So he said they look like preachers, they act like preachers, they got a Bible on their arm, but he said if you study and show yourself approved, you'll be able to tell when they're lying to you. And then you know what he says to you? Don't even argue with them. He said shun them. Do you remember the old days what shunning was? How many of you know what that is? Oh good, God bless you Bible believers, you know what it is. You know how it is to act like somebody. I ain't talking to you, you wicked. Colossians chapter number 2. Shunning them means stay away from them. Notice what he says. I like verse 7 just because, well, verse 6. Well, all of Colossians has a lot of in him and by him and all that other kind of stuff. Then notice he says in verse number 7, Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, that you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you. That's steal from you. That's rot you. Through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Philosophy, the love of wisdom. All your major philosophers were, were homosexual. They're queer. What do they know about life? They govern themselves and sit around and think about it and justify their sin. Sit around and think about it and please themselves. That's your philosophers. That's what they tell you to study. Rudiments of the world. I wrote these down. I think I got them from the old preacher or maybe out of a commentary. I don't remember. Rudiments of the world. You got to make a living. So that's okay to work on Sunday? Oh, you got to make a living. Here's a good one. You have to be married. Do you really? Was Paul married? Paul said, I would that you were as I am. You say, well, Paul, well, we think Paul couldn't have been in the Sanhedrin unless he was married. Well, if he was married, there's no mention of him or his kids or her or, her, or the kids. You don't have to be married. Young ladies, listen to me. You don't have to be married. You don't need a millstone about your neck. <laughs> Preacher, it just depends on how you look at it. How am I doing so far? I'm talking about rudiments of the world. This is what the world tells you. Everybody else does it. That's a good one. I, I know when I can quit. How about that one? Um, uh, does God approve of what you're doing? Then do it. Paul says all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. I'll not be all under the power of any. The old preacher's interpretation. Can you ask God to bless it? Then he'd say chug a lug. Smoke them if you got them. Deal it. 21 or bus. Blackjack. Remember the illustration? Well, he's telling it right. You say, do you listen to that stuff? Nearly every day. You say, why? It's solid. It's sound. It's been sound since the 50s, man. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> he, he hasn't changed that. You don't have to change a doctrinally straight message. You preach the same message. I'll grant you some of the illustrations and things like that. You wouldn't know who the people are. But the point is, is whether you know the person or not, he illustrates the point with that. You know what he's trying to tell you here? He's trying to tell you, you have to be careful about what you listen to. Now, you live in a day and time, if there was ever uh, something you need to hear, come back, if you will, please, to 1 Timothy. Uh, if there was ever a time you need to be careful, it's in the day that you live now. And that day now is, is you've got television, you've got internet, you've got iPods and iPads, and you've got every kind of audio device in the world. You can get it over Wi-Fi now. You can get it over Bluetooth now. You can get it just about every way that you could possibly imagine or think about. You know what he's doing? He's giving you a warning. He's saying, it don't matter who it is and how big the congregation is, you better be careful of what you're listening to. Here's why. You get emotionally attached to the person that teaches you something that helps you. And the next thing you know, you start ignoring the false doctrine being taught because they're nice people. 
And they will ruin you at the judgment seat of Christ if you're saved because they're trying to steal from you, spoil you, take something from you, come in and rob you of something that belongs to you. Now, the illustration he makes here fits for us today. Notice what he says in the passage. He said, it'll increase to more ungodliness, not may, but will. Their word doth eat as a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who coming to the truth have erred, who concerning the truth, excuse me, have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, overthrow the faith of some. Now, we better pause right there just a minute. The resurrection already occurred? That's what he just told you what they're teaching. You know what he did? He called them out. Now, listen, does that sound like modern preaching today? No. He's telling you these two guys are teaching you that the resurrection has already occurred and they've overthrown the faith of some. So some people have quit believing that there's a resurrection coming because these guys were such prolific and powerful preachers that they were able to convince people who did not know their Bible, who did not study, who had not been properly instructed. They were so good and so convincing that they said, well, then why bother? There's no point. The resurrection already took place. So I guess we just make things better. So it all becomes earthly. It all becomes worldly. It all becomes about the here and now. And Paul calls them out and said, don't pay any attention to them. They're false teachers. They're false preachers. They're individuals that will cause you to err concerning them. And another passage he said, who have made them a shipwreck, meaning they crashed into the rocks. You say, why? Because they're good teachers. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, some of the people I make reference to have better oratory skills than I could ever even think of. They're better studied and better prepared than I am. They've had more co uh, college courses and some of them have PhDs and they're very convincing. You have to be extremely careful when you're listening to false teachers and false preachers. You say, how do I tell? You have a Bible and the Holy Spirit. If you have a Bible and the Holy Spirit, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit will tell you, here's what it says in the book. And you say, well, Lord, here's what they say. Okay, you're going to take my word or theirs. And right there, you get that thing taken care of. All right, look, if you will, please. He said, nevertheless, the foundation of God stand this uh, uh, firm. Let me, make, let me take you over to the book of James real quick. Come to James chapter 5. James chapter number 5. Uh, Paul says, you turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I don't know that I've ever, that I know of, I've ever prayed that prayer, but there have been a couple of times with some Christian men that I know that have gotten caught up in some of the foolishness that is appealing to the flesh, and it has to do with anti-Semitic and anti-governmental and political foolishness. And, and to be honest with you, it makes me angry. Because I see people following after them and they think they're getting some new thing taught to them that's some wild and amazing. Oh, I've just never heard that before. It's just the most uh, amazing things. And careful, this is what the Bible says. Well, I know, but I, I mean, I know you teach the pre-tribulation rapture, but you know, they seem to make some good points here. You listen to them long enough, they'll talk you right out of your points. You listen to them long enough, you'll take 2 Thessalonians 2, which is one of their favorite places, and they'll have you in the tribulation period, and they'll have you looking for the Antichrist, and they'll have you looking for the falling away, and they'll have you looking for everything but Jesus Christ. Yes. Instead of looking for the, the, the uh, God to appear in the, in the sky, the great glory, the, uh, uh, the Redeemer. Jesus Christ looks up, your redemption draweth nigh. They'll have you doing everything in the world but doing what God tells you to do. So what are you doing? Preparing for the tribulation. Can you show me one verse where Paul tells them to prepare for the tribulation? One verse in the Pauline epistles. Well, Paul sure thought he was in there. Paul sure thought it was coming. Paul sure believed the rapture could take place. He believed in the imminent return. He said, but you're not appointed to wrath. He never tells them to go buy stuff and to get prepared for the tribulation. Not one place. It would almost make you wonder, make you ponder, wouldn't it? That if Paul doesn't tell us to prepare for the tribulation, you would almost think it might be because we're not going to be here. What do you think? And then your verses wind up fitting perfectly. Your Bible's written in a premillennial fashion. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say it to you until the day I kick off. You're going to have the rapture take place and it's going to go back to the Jew.
you're going to have the judgment seat of Christ. And after we're done with that, we're going to eat supper and then we're going to come riding back on a horse. You're going to go out like Superman, come back like the Lone Ranger. And you're going to fight down there in the Battle of Armageddon. And after the Battle of Armageddon, that's what you'll see Matthew 24 in the Tribulation. You won't. You'll be up there in heaven. And Matthew 25, Judgment of Nations after the Battle of Armageddon. Then the Millennial Kingdom will be set up. At the end of the Millennial Kingdom, Satan will come up out of the pit. He's been down there for a thousand years. He's let go. He goes up north where Meshach and Tubal are. And he gets the people that are up there in what's now known as uh, Russia. And he grabs him some people up there and puts him together a multi-million man army. And he comes against the Lord. Even during the millennial reign, God has enemies. And he comes down there and you folks are sitting there thinking, well, shoot, man, we haven't been riding in a thousand years. I guess we better saddle up. And the Lord said, no, I'll fight this one. And he fights that one with the spirit of his mouth and destroys them with the brightness of his coming. And then you have the great white throne judgment. Heaven and earth are passed away and there's no more sea. And then the Lord recreates everything. You say, what's going on with the great white throne judgment? All those individuals come up there and there's nothing for them to stand on. They're out there in space. The Lord burns up the whole thing. Now, you get on the right side of that by being saved in this age, this, 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 this dispensation, this time period. And then what happens for you? If you die, ask for the body present with the Lord. If you're here when the Lord uh, blows the horn and you get out of here and you get called, come up hither. When you get hauled out of here, your body will be changed into a body like unto His body. And up through the sky you'll go, judgment seat of Christ and so on and so forth. That's the premillennial fashion of your Bible. And it makes every piece fit where it's supposed to fit. Well, what about these people? It's not you. Don't worry about it. I'll show you where it fits, but it don't fit for you. Well, what if I don't endure to the end? Endure to the end of what? Enduring to the end always is a reference to the end of the tribulation. It has nothing to the end of what? The end of your life? No, it's the end of the tribulation period. Whenever he mentions that stuff, if you're careful, you know what you'll find? You'll find that Jew in there and in the tribulation. I just listened to a preacher the other day. He's dogmatic. He's teaching the rapture out of Matthew 24. Do you know the rapture wasn't even known about in Matthew 24? Do you even know that? You say, no, uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is the Gospels. Pauline revelation wasn't there. The mystery of the church wasn't revealed yet. And Jesus Christ coming in the clouds wasn't written about. All that they knew was the second coming of Christ. Matthew 24 has to do with the book of Revelation more than any of the other stuff. The apostle Paul is not referring to that at the rapture. He goes through there and all the volcanoes and earthquake. And of course, he had to throw Corona in there. Coronavirus. Oh, it's the coronavirus. And, and that's the plagues. And the horses are already riding the war. And, and they're getting ready to, to, uh, to, to create a war. And Israel's going to go to battle. And, and Gog and Magog are coming against. And China and Russia are going to team up together with Iran. And, and they're going to come across through Turkey and all this other kind of stuff. I'm sitting there listening to this stuff. And I'm getting madder by the minute. Because I'm realizing... If anybody had a Bible and a preacher that had been teaching them, they'd turn that fool off. Somebody's backing that guy up and he calls himself a Baptist preacher. And I'm saying to myself, well, boy, I wouldn't want to be you at the judgment seat. Teaching the rapture out of Matthew 24. You know what he's doing? Prepare for the coming. I'm thinking, keep on going, keep on going. What are you going to do when he says, don't come down if it be in the winter and so on and so forth, and don't come down and grab a ham sandwich but take off running and, and all that when he sits there in the temple and calls him. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do when it's in and around Jerusalem? What are you going to do with that? He no answers for it. He turned the whole thing into the church, the whole cotton-picking thing into the church. The church is not even mentioned in Matthew 24. Judgment of nations. You know what he's got that? That's the great white throne. The sheep and the goats. No sheep and goats at the great white throne. That's the judgment of nations. That happens down here on earth. That's individuals come into the millennium if they took care of the Jew and they go out into hell on earth at the time during the, at the end of the battle of Armageddon. You take care of the Jew, you come on in. You didn't take care of the Jew, go to hell. Where's hell? Right there. Right there. Literally, I guess I need to reteach that. Some of y'all are like, what? Yeah, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses get it right. They just have the right thing in the wrong place. Hell will be in earth in the millennium. You don't fear him that can cast their body into hell, but fear him that can cast body and soul into hell. He gets it all out of place. You know what happens there? That is not the great white throne judgment. You even got to mess up in your Schofield Bible about that, the day of the Lord and the day of Christ and bringing that thing to the judgment of nations. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he makes a reference to Matthew 25. Well, preacher, you're not as smart as he was. You know, he was a true doctor and he was this and that and the other and all that kind of stuff. No, but I got a Bible I can read. The day of Christ has nothing to do with that judgment. 
That's the judgment of nations. That's individuals that took care of the Jew. When saw we you naked, and when saw we clothed you, and when saw we hungry and fed you, and when saw we without water and gave you to drink, and when saw we in prison and came to visit you. And the Lord said, If you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. My brethren, who is that? Come on, my brethren, who is that? It's Jews. It ain't you. You're his bride. You're not his brethren. Preached a whole sermon on it. Probably got a million dollars in. That guy's all over the creation preaching the spear monger stuff of telling the people he's ripping it from the headlines and reading all this uh, uh, intense uh, prophetic stuff. You'd think he's Edgar Casey laying on a couch having a nightmare during the nighttime and then telling you what he saw out in the distance. Y'all know who Casey is, right? How about Nostradamus? Get you a little bowl of water and put a fire under the thing. You sniff enough smoke, you'll see all kind of things. And then look into that gaze, into that pot right there. And, you know, well, Nostradamus is right some of the time. Well, why didn't he write it right? Yeah. He was, he was, he was uh, uh, covering his quatrains so that you couldn't clearly understand. That book says if he's a prophet, he gets it 100% of the time. You don't have to cover for him. Show me where Jesus misfired once. You know, if you ever read the Koran, I recommend you read it. You'll, then you'll use it to start your fireplace with next time. But I recommend you read it. You say, why? You read that stuff, you'll think, my goodness, man, I'm glad I'm a Christian. I'm not under all that. Ladies, you think you've got rules to obey now? Read the Koran, man. You'll be running around in a stinking burqa. You'll have on a stinking straitjacket. You won't be able to do anything. And your husband can beat you at least once a year whether you need it or not. That's in the Hadith. How am I doing? And he can have mistresses up to four. How'd you like that, ma'am? But I recommend you read that. You say, why? It'll make you appreciate Christianity, man. You won't find a word of prophecy in there. You say, why? That dog can't, that dog can't hunt, as they used to say. That, that dog can't prophesy. You know what your book is? The testimony of, of your salvation is prophecy. The spirit of prophecy. You can preach. You say, what? I ain't going to hell. I'm going to heaven. Prophesy. <laughs> Judgment seat of Christ. Rapture taking place. That kind of thing. You won't find anything like that in the Koran. It's a boring book to read. It's just a book of rules. You know, and... You got to east and west and got to face the right way and all that. And you have to wash a certain way and all ceremonial stuff. I'll give this to them. They're committed to their cause. Yeah, man, they're committed. They're going to stop in the middle of the day and throw a rug down and get down there and pray. I'm not recommending you get a rug and somebody don't think you're a Muslim, but it sure wouldn't hurt you to be like Daniel and pray at least three times a day. I told you this morning, Paul said, I have not committed the sin to cease and praying for you. All right, look at this thing, if you could, please, in James chapter number 5. Let me try to hurry. It's making sense to you? Yeah. Listen, what he's trying to do is, is to tell you that when these people tell you that stuff, canker is like, um, oh, what's that thing they used to get? That little boy um, that had his leg cut off there had it real bad. Uh, gangrene, gangrene, thank you. Gangrene. He used to be a, uh, a boy downtown. I'll think of his name here in a minute. He carried a little uh, uh, Ruger um, Saturday night special in his leg. You had to be real careful with him. But at any rate, he got gangrene real bad in his stump. At first it was, you know, down here, and then it came on up here, and then it came on up here and got up there around where his knee was. But uh, Barber was his last name. I can't remember his first name right now. But you had to be real careful. Man, when you took that leg off, that gangrene come in there and you get this so, so turned off by the smell of the thing, you think, man, I don't want to even take a look at it. Well, you have to take a look at it if you're going to do anything for it. You've got to clean it up. You've got to get it right. You know what he says? That word is like a canker. It's like gangrene. And gangrene will wind up eating you from inside out. And it stinks to high heaven. Look at this thing in James chapter number 3. The Bible says in verse 3, make it 2. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. The rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Boy, if that ain't a comment on the days in which you're living. You heap treasure together on the last days and the Lord said, I'm going to destroy every bit of it. I'm going to let it rot. I'm going to let it rust. You say, well, you got no use for it. 
You get to read in the book of Revelation. I'm going to have to quit. You get to read in the book of Revelation. You know what happened? Because I got to cover this thing about concern and truth. And I've got about eight references we're going to have to look at concern and truth. And I'll get that for you on uh, next Sunday. I'll be in uh, Washington and Texas this week. But here's the thing. You, you get to looking at that thing and you start finding out that the Lord comes in and he said that for a, a cup of, of dove's dung, that's what they're eating in the book of Lamentation. They're giving you a week's salary for a cup of dove's dung and a donkey's head. You sure got to be hungry to be eating dove dung. Well, preacher, that's pretty bleak. Well, I thank the Lord I'm on the right side of things. Amen. You say, what does that do? That comes from people being taught something that ain't in that book. And that Bible says, and you start listening to that, it will increase to more ungodliness in your actions, not just your doctrine. All right.